Right. Well, it looks like the um, the entrants have stopped and we have our group together for today. Um, I'd like to begin uh, by saying welcome to the Public Humanities Hub Public Scholarship Speaker Series on Art and Testimony, co-hosted with the University of Victoria's Survivor-Centered Visual Narratives. I'm Andrea Webb, Project Co-Director and Faculty Member in the Department of Curriculum and Pedagogy within the Faculty of Education at UBC. With my colleagues, Dr. Charlotte Chalier and Barbara Yellen, we welcome you to today's discussion. We want to begin by acknowledging that UBC is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Hunkaminam-speaking Musqueam people, land on which we are uninvited guests. We are grateful to be able to do this work here, and because today's panel is virtual, we invite attendees to acknowledge the territory from which they are joining us today. In today's webinar, Charlotte and Barbara will be talking about the recently public graphic narrative in collaboration with Emmy Arbel. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, as a Yuvik scholar, I acknowledge and respect with gratitude and humility the Lekwang and Songnis and Esquimalt peoples on whose territory the University of Victoria stands and the Lekwang and Vasanich peoples whose historical relationship with the land continue to this day. I'm very grateful to be here today with Barbara Yelin, but also with Amy Arbel, who is joining us or will be joining us in the audience. Good evening, Amy Lila Toff. It is so lovely that you are with us today. First, I would like to begin with a content framing uh, written by Ray Costain on behalf of the Survivor Centered Visual Narratives Project. Today's conversation engages the story of Amy Arbel, who is a child survivor of the Holocaust. Amy's story, as told in the graphic novel, Amy Abel, The Color of Memory, Amy Abel, Die Farbe der Erinnerung, involves references to her experiences in concentration camps, as well as experiences of sexual assault. While we feel it is important to engage with the truth of these stories, we recognize that we all arrive to these conversations with our own personal histories that shape our reactions and responses. We invite you to practice care for yourself however you need to while witnessing Emmy's story. As the co-director of the Survivor Centered Visual Narratives Project, I respectfully acknowledge that my work is grounded in community-engaged scholarship and learning. Thus, I would like to express my deep appreciation to all partners in research. It's now my great honor to introduce Barbara Yelin. Barbara is a graphic novelist and illustrator. She was born 1977 in Munich and studied illustration at the Hamburg University of Applied Sciences. Barbara has worked as a comics artist for newspapers and international anthologies. Her work largely focuses on research-based historical and biographical graphic novels, mainly about women. In 2014, Barbara published the award-winning graphic novel Irmina. In 2016, she was declared the best German language comics artist at the International Comic Salon in Erlangen. Barbara lives and works in Munich. I have had the privilege and joy of knowing Barbara and Amy since 2019, when we started working together on a shorter graphic narrative titled, But I Live. This project was supported by Shirk Partnership Development Grant. But I Live is also the title of a larger volume that includes Barbara's graphic novel together with two other graphic narratives. A Kind of Resistance by Miriam Libicki, created in partnership with David Schaefer, and I see that David is joining us today as well. Welcome, David. And the other story is called 13 Secrets by Gilad Selikta, a graphic novel that was created in collaboration with Nico and Rolf Kamp. This collection was published with New Jewish Press in Canada and Seha Beck in Germany in 2022. In today's webinar session, Barbara will focus on her most recent work, the full-length graphic novel, Amy Abel, The Color of Memory, which is an extension of But I Live. This work is supported by a Shirk funded Survivor Centered Visual Narratives Project. Together with Alexander Korb, I'm the co-editor of this book. I would also like to acknowledge the work of our student researcher, PhD candidate Shanine Bultz, who transcribed all the conversations and interview sessions between Barbara and Emmy. Likewise, I would like to acknowledge the invaluable contributions of Dinke Hondius, Matthias Heil, 
Jennifer Soter, Matt Hukulak, and Jan-Erik Dubelmann, who together with many others on our research team have supported the work of Barbara and Emmy. Today, Barbara will reflect on how drawing can be used as a language to gather memories and trauma-informed storytelling. Barbara will begin with a reading from select pages of The Color of Memory, grounding the conversation in Emmy's story, Emmy's voice, and the visual arts-based methodology of the Survivor-Centered Visual Narratives Project. Now, over to you, Barbara. Thank you very, very much, Charlotte. Um, I'm very happy that you invited me today and that I could join this webinar. And I, you know, I'm very glad and happy that I could work with you and with the whole project uh, the last four years, actually, already. And uh, I want to thank everyone who, uh, for, who organized this uh, event today and who made it possible. And I would like to start to show some sequences from the recent book, uh, which I drew and wrote together. So, so I based on and in dialogue together with Emmy Abel. And um, Emmy and me, we had very, uh, ah, yes, and Emmy is here, I hear. So I am very happy that you will be joining, you are joining us, Emmy. Um, Emmy and me, we had many, many conversations together. And you will see that in also in the scenes that I will present right now. But I would like to um, add something before. Um, okay, just a second. Yes, so this is the title it's still in German. The English title is Emmy Abel, The Color of Memory. Um, we are just working on the translation, on the English translation. So for the first time tonight, we can see uh, the English pages from the new part of the book. Um, it's translated um, by Helge Dascher, and uh, I'm very happy to work with her uh, about the translation at the very moment. So it's in the process. And um, First of all, I want to thank Emmy for her time and for her confidence and for our friendship. And this book could only be done, could only um, entstehen, could only evolve on the base of our conversations. And it was from the start, it was an open process. We would never know where we would land, how much pages we would do. So it was always possible to, 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 to follow the process in every direction that um, it was important, that we found out that this, it was important. And I met Emmy the first time, it's already almost five years ago. Um, I will show it in the comic right now, but I want to show you two images before, two pictures. These have been sent to me by the Memorial Ravensburg, who was also a partner in the in this project, and uh, who knew the Emmy and the Memorial, uh, the people of the Memorial are working together since uh, two decades, I would say, and they sent me these pictures before, and that was so um, moving, and also shocking, and I want to tell you about these pictures uh, to, to see them. This is Emmy Abel, born 1937, and the picture is from 1942. It was taken short, shortly before Emmy and her Jewish family have been deported by the Nazis to Camp Westerbor. Emmy survived three concentration camps, and this picture here shows also Emmy, and it was 1945 or 46, not really sure when, but uh, it was uh, for sure, it was after the liberation. Um, she was in an orphanage and her parents, as well as her grandparents, had been murdered by the Nazis. What happened in between she told me about in her memories. And she told me much more, but this was the door, the entrance 
um, where we started to speak about. Tivon, Israel, 1977. I ran out of the house. It was the middle of the night. I had to get out. Otherwise, I would have, in just another moment, Hannah simply exploded. Emmy, Hannah was just turning off the lights. She hugged me without saying a word. We sat all night. In the beginning, I said, I don't remember anything. But it came back. Ravensbrück Memorial, Germany, 2019. With few exceptions, the barracks are all gone. The Red Army dismantled them in 1945 and reassembled them elsewhere to provide housing for the refugees returning from the East. The Black Rebel was laid down later for the Memorial Museum, where the barracks had been. Beyond the walls are the former accommodation blocks for the female SS guards. Excuse me, I'm looking for Matthias, the interpretive guide or the educational director of the memorial. That's me. Are you Barbara? We spoke on the phone, right? Come, I'll take you to Amy. We just finished eating lunch. She's waiting for you. There, that's her. You have an hour. I mean, this is Barbara Yelin. It is very nice to meet you. Hello. So I met Emmy in the memorial site of Ravensbrück. Emmy goes there since 20 years to speak about her memories, to speak to young adults. And um, that was a situation where I met her. Can we find a quiet place? Over there is a bench in the shade. And I want a cigarette. Okay, click, shoot. The past is still here. It's here inside me. And do you think that a graphic novel is able to tell you memories, Emmy? Hmm, to be honest. I'm living my life the way I want it to. My life is good. I'm not sure. I have everything. Ah, there's Michal. My daughter. Hello, says Michal. I have to go now. We'll meet a group of students, says Emmy. Let's stay in contact, Emmy, okay? I say. I need to catch the 4 p.m. train to Berlin. I hope you don't get caught in the rain. Although it would be nice if it finally cooled off a bit. Matthias? Yes. Don't people swim in the lake? Well, there's a lot of ash in it. Sorry, that oh, is missing a page. Um, but I won't forget, says Emmy. We switch scenes. In early spring 2020, I visited Emmy in Kiryativon to interview her about her memories. We spent four days together. Big car. Yes, my car is my husband and my legs. You want some coffee, too?
Yes, please. I like your house. Hmm. This is much better than the Nescafe at the Airbnb. <laughs> I told you to stay in my guest room. Do you take sugar? Thanks, just milk for me. I don't take sugar either. But I always put the sugar ball on the table with her spoon. I don't have anything else from her. It was from my mother. It was in our house. She touched it and I touch it. Only the spoon. Tick. And nothing else. I don't remember when this picture was taken. But I remember when we were at the photo studio. I think that my dress was blue with white and red doll cuttings, a uh, polka dot, sorry. And I look happy, don't I? Smile, young lady. Flesh, beautiful. Can you please put the penguin back with the other toys? Thank you. I was born in Holland. My family was Jewish. I had parents and two brothers. Let's hurry home. Pa is coming home tonight. Yes, mommy. Come, Annie. I don't remember. I was four and a half when two policemen came to our house and took us to Westerbork transit camp. There were many people and we had no privacy. My mother put up a, how do you call it, a laken, a sheet. We were there a long time. I don't remember much from there. But I recall the weekly fear about who would be deported next to other camp. I don't remember the day when they took our father. Then the rest of us were deported to Ravensbrück. My oldest brother was later separated from us. Odi and me stayed with our mother. I saw many, many women. They were all wore the same clothes, strange clothes, in blue and white. I remember all kind of voices in the night, all kind of women who were crying. Oh, oh. I remember that I was hungry all the time. It hurts to be hungry. It really hurts. It hurts in your stomach. I remember that it was cold and rain and snow. I had lost my shoes and my mother had made me some from Yuta. Death was among us every day. Knock, knock. Ah, there are Oli and Neria. I brought vegetables, Ima. This is Oli, the oldest daughter. Ima is the Hebrew word for mom. Shalom, grandma, says Neria, the grandchild. Let me open my window first. Can I go to the computer? Okay, but save my solitaire game. I had parents. I need my solitaire when I can sleep last night, uh, sleep at night. What is he singing? He sings to the computer like karaoke. He can do it all day. He's obsessed with it. That's nice. <laughs> it's horrible. When I was his age, we had just arrived in the kibbutz in Israel. I saw the other children and I always felt that I'm different. I couldn't sing, I couldn't dance like they did. Never. Excuse me, I go to the bathroom. After they took us to Camp Ravensbrück, we had to take off our clothes. And we had to stand in a row. And it took a lot of time to stand there. And then I saw that they shaved our hair. And I tried to escape. I think then I began to rebel. I think from this moment, it began. 
run away, run away. Amy, hurt, and then they hit me. Or they hit my mother. I think both of us. And then they took off our hair. Let's go out for a coffee. Okay. They draw out near ya. Once, one of my daughters cut the hair very, very short. I don't remember if it was Orly or Tammy. I thought I would begin to cry. They didn't do it again. Over there, this is there's this is the cafe where I want to go to go to. Today, many young people they shave their hair on one side. They make good coffee. For me, schrecklich. Oh no, it's closed. Let's look for another place. What about the cafe over there? Um, that's too crowded for me. I told you, I don't like to be among many people. And I need to sit near the door with my back to the wall. I remember us standing for hours. And my mother fainted. You know, even as a child, you learn quickly how to survive. I knew I must stay standing. I should not do anything. Because I knew if I'd go to her, they would shoot me. And I was afraid. I was so afraid that she was dying. So I stayed standing. After being in Ravensburg, Amy, her brother, and the mother will be deported to another uh, concentration camp. It's Camp Bergen-Belsen. And I won't show this scene. It is six weeks before the liberation. And Amy remembers also many moments from that. Um, what she remembers very deeply is that her mother died. The mother died tragically a few days after the liberation of the camp from hunger and exhaustion and illness. And she could not be saved anymore. And the brother um, Rudy and Emmy are with her. And now I go back to the story. 1945, the war was over. Our mother was dead. Our grandparents had been murdered by the Nazis in Auschwitz. Our father in Buchenwald. My brother and me were DPs, displaced persons. I don't remember how my brother Rudi and I came to Sweden. I know it was, it was with a boat. Some things I know, but I don't remember them. I came to the Kinderheim and later to the hospital. I had tuberculosis. I am a rebel. In the foster home, they treated us well. But they had fish every day. I didn't like fish. A nurse would sit with me and force me to eat everything up. One day I took matches and lit up the curtains. I wanted to burn the whole house. Of course, it was not only about the fish. In February 1946, Rudi and me were brought to Holland and reunited with our oldest brother. We were all adapted by a Jewish foster family. Will it take long? No, no, it's just a sketch. I told you that every time when I come back later to Germany, 
I had the feeling that I must steal something. I must, I just must. What did you steal? Oh, something small. But is it something you know? I can show you. Yes, please. And she keeps it. Until today, her daughter says, Ollie. That's me? Yes, what do you think? Huh? Impressive. So I don't like to look at myself in a picture. But it will be a graphic novel. It will contain images of you, many images. <laughs> I know. It's not the image, it's me. That's who I am. Here, this is what it took. What is it? Schraubhaken, something to put pictures into the wall. Yes, things like this. I don't like the word survivor. Poor him, poor her, poor she, she survived. I don't like that people feel sorry for me or think that I'm weak. I wasn't weak. I know. I know that I'm strong. So the time is running, so I want I will just show you some of the pages. Charlotte, is it okay if I get two or three more minutes? Um, it always takes a bit longer than I thought. We are, after the war in Bildhof, Netherlands, all three siblings have survived. They meet each other in Holland and they find a foster family. And this is something which is also in the book that in this foster family, Emmy suffers, so she, 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 she will, um, she, it will happen another, sorry, no, I'm uh, looking for words. She suffers from another um, crime. She will be sexually abused by the foster father. And this will go for one year when she is eight or nine years old. I won't read this scene, um, but I will read you the images where we talk about the scene and the images where Emmy shows how, and, and I, want, I, I like to show how we discussed what will be in the book and what can be in the book, and for what can we find images, and what is not in the book, and how she was always leading that process, and always um, knowing what she wanted. Emmy, do you want this to be in the book? Yes, I do. For a long time, I didn't want to speak about it. I don't want you to explain exactly what happened and how I felt about it. It shouldn't be the main subject. But it's just one of the difficult things that happened to me in my life. But it is one of the things. That is what I want. I like to eat now. You can write that. I like a break now. This is Emmy's garden. We have seen her house. It is what I found the center. Uh, of her life and also of the story of her present life and it is a very beautiful home and for also for the book this beautiful home and this strong woman is another aspect from the book we wanted very uh, much to show also in the book so it is a book that is not only about um, Emmy's memories uh, traumatic memories but it is also about a very um, strong woman who have to, has to deal with these memories and who had a life um, with a many um, yes with a lot of with a lot of, of effort and strength and also love to 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 live life and to also to have life for her children. My birthday calendar, 
but I also write into, into it when somebody dies. Okay, I will, sh I will uh, read because this is too much now. This is her family. The last scene, and then I stop. She won 2022. Emmy, what color is memory? What color? Black. When there's a program about the concentration camps on TV or when somebody talks about the war, I feel things, but I can't express it. I can't talk about it. It's associ associated with a feeling of humiliation. That is the strongest feeling that I have when I talk about my memory. Humiliation. I was not a human being. I was a number, you know. I feel like no one can understand what I'm feeling. But if I don't talk about it, others can under can't understand. They can't understand what happened. And it must not happen again. Click. And that's why I have to speak. Now I watch TV. This is how I relax. Emmy, mind if I draw you now? Hmm? Okay. You won't even notice me. Thank you. Now I stop my presentation. Thank you, Barbara, very much. Thank you very much for this beautiful um, reading. We oftentimes don't think of reading graphic novels aloud. Your reading really draws attention to the multi-layeredness of, of voices, of perspectives, and of time periods. We have now about half an hour of a conversation, followed by a QA. and a And audience members, please feel free to post your questions using the, the Q&A function we will do our very best to answer all of your questions. Barbara, my first question um, relates to how it all started. Emmy's <clears throat> written testimony consists of five pages. Early on in our project together, I never imagined that this testimony could be extended to 36 pages as it is in um, But I Live, and now in The Color of Memory to 164 pages, which is the equivalent of 900 panel drawings. I, I think you're making the most compelling case for why visual storytelling is such a powerful tool of engagement with life story writing. So can you can we go back to the beginning? How did you know or how did you decide that Amy's five page testimony could be the starting point or the foundation for for a longer graphic novel? I think we, we did not know in the beginning. Mm -hmm. It was open. And I think that was mm -hmm. that was necessary, that everything could be open, that the dialogue could be open, the conversations could be open. But there was something Emmy said Emmy said um to Matthias and then afterwards to me that she said, My first memories are images. I don't have words for them. And this is something, of course, about what we could connect about that I could fi find images for things that are in the memory but it is di difficult to describe or it is maybe not there but we still need room for it um, to show it also the empty spaces of the of the memory but uh, what made it possible was um, that we understood each other that Emmy gave me so much of her time and mm -hmm. that we could speak in all directions. Um, and I think that was, like I said in the beginning, the basis where we came from. And um, so I traveled to Israel. So also after the pandemic, Emmy traveled to Germany and we met a lot on video uh, Zoom calls. Um, so we had many levels of conversations and what, the, the direct words of Emmy found many of them found the direct way into the graphic novel. 
and it was always an exchange. So we spoke in English, both not our mother tongue. Uh, Emmy speaks many languages fluently. I, I, I don't, it's only English and German. So we met in English and um, so there were many languages in the room but one of these languages have been the images the drawings that we exchange also in a in a early in an early stage now you work together with emmy from 2019 2023 and i would say the process is ongoing because it's a relationship and it's a friendship and there is care attention and love and that doesn't just stop and I, i'm I'm, I'm extremely grateful that Amy is with us today. Amy has uh, chosen not to speak, but of course, anytime Amy would like to say something, please, please do do so. So we have hundreds of hours of recorded interview sessions and transcriptions. And again, I'd like to thank Shanine for transcribing the sessions. So Barbara, how did you decide which parts of the interview session should become the graphic novel? You mentioned it's an open, ongoing process and you decide as you go along still. I'm, I'm curious because there's just so much material uh, and was it was very obvious in the reading, the story doesn't follow a chronological structure. So how did you weave the visual narratives together? And I'm glad you're showing us early sketches. I, I, yes. yeah. I'm showing these sketches because yeah. this is showing how the process of the graphic novel can made. So my process of the graphic mm -hmm. novel was, and this shows at the same time my thinking process. So the basis have been the words of Emmy and our conversations. And there are sentences in the beginning that I note on the paper, but um, that was the very beginning. But then very quickly, I were uh, um, starting this, uh, to draw storyboards. So I say storyboards, there are different words, but the kind of sketches for the, for the pages. And there I tried how to combine which which uh, parts to which parts of the words I wanted to use and which parts I wanted to combine with with which images. And of course, I there was a, a, a huge, huge, huge amount of uh, conversation. So um, this is something I think it was with some scene already when I heard it, it was for me very clear that I, I would like to try to have it in the book because the scene already was in the conversation so strong and so important. Uh, this is, for example, the scene where, where in the foster home. And um, there were others that I collected and then found maybe two years later that they have been very important and all that I was speaking about with Emmy but also not only with her so not, but with you with Alex Cobb and with many people uh, who helped us with the book I want to to speak about that also because there was was really a circle of collaborative work with historians research helps um, um, transcribe that I helped with, to, with the transcribing and otherwise this work could not have been done. I spoke with many people who were helping me, historians, trauma experts, for example, and that was extraordinary um, and very, yes, yes, a, a good, a, a, a special, a special atmosphere to work where science and, and the historians and artists and first of all the survivors themselves the um, um, met and spoke with each other and drawing is always the way for me to go to 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 to, to come closer to uh, to a story to history to parts of history because when i draw i i i, I think about questions i find questions that I didn't know, even know that I would have them. And then we shared that again, these questions, Emmy and me, but also you and me. And I think you have, I mean, we, we also had conversations, the three of us. So it was more that, uh, than uh, just only uh, working in my studio on this, on much, much more. Yes. And I, th I think it's really extraordinary how drawing brought us all together. 
and and yes. and you said it so well you and and um Hank Greenspan, who's with us today and ask a question, well, we sure will be on, uh, responding to that, Hank. Um, really, when Hank said, oftentimes art is an afterthought. So there, there is the engagement with the survivor or there is an existing testimony and then we add art. This is not what's been happening in this project. We center the voice of Emmy and we center art. And you really use art as a critical tool of inquiry and that was an enormous learning process for us and and that collaboration that you speak about that collaboration that partnership that care for one another that community of care we all committed to to build and sustain really helped us through the project because it's it's difficult work it's 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 work that carries weight um tra trauma is here and we, we certainly don't want to create more harm. And I really think in this proce process of being together with one another, it was really continues to be very, very meaningful to me. I I wanted to ask you, Barbara, because what's so striking amongst many other things uh, in your work is the, the fact that you hold space for memories, for Emmy's memories that cannot be traced back anymore. You read sequences and Emmy says, oftentimes Emmy, um, Please allow me to quote you. I don't remember, or I or Amy says, I know it happened to me, but I don't remember. Again, in a more trans traditional testimony, this will not show up. It will be edited. We, we, we won't repeat a survivor saying, I don't remember. But it in Amy's story, life story, beyond the Holocaust, it has had a very strong presence. So memory lives in Emmy's body almost, and it, it inhabits a strong presence in Emmy's life, but it cannot be captured in word only. Can you tell us more about how you drew Emmy's lived experience, the memory that's in her, but for which there are no words? And and you showed some of the panels already when when it when it diffuses into an abstract panel, but but can you speak more about that? Because that's one of the strengths of the graphic novel and one of the great strengths of your work as well. Yes, thank you. Um, I go back to um, the image here because this is part of what I found out how to work about memory. Perhaps I'm, I go a bit closer. Um, for me, this work was a bit like pieces of a puzzle memory work memory have we there are there are parts that we can remember there are parts that emmy could not remember there were parts uh, that emmy said this was told by my brother for example but i don't remember so i know it but i don't remember she was very ac accurate how she told me that and there were images memory as an image, memory as a word, memory as a sentence, and when memory then, they're like missing pieces of a puzzle. And how to combine the story, um, the narration of this memory was really like how to find, how can I put this puzzle to, together? Which parts do I put next to each other? And what I learned when I, when, when Emmy uh, told me about her life and her memories was how much these memories um, intrude the present. So they that the, there is that the, the, the time, the past and the present is actually at the same time for her sometimes. So I try to show this really by building these uh, scenes um, the, that memory and present time is, is directly next to each other. And there, of course, we come to color so what are the colors, um, the different rooms of colors of her life? So there is a darker color for the memory um, in, the, in the concentration camps. So it's black, like she said to me. There's another color, like a blue room, which is uh, the memory um, of, her, of her family, from her family. So the memories to her family. And then there is a, a, a color room, which is more, uh, warm and orange and brown, which is uh, the, the Israel now in in the last years. And 
So there are rooms of colors we entrance, and I don't have to describe it with words then, that we change uh, the time. Yes. And there are, of course, sources, the historical sources. I can go even closer. Uh, Arolds and Archives have been a very important collaboration partner. And they collected all traces of um, the persecuted um, Jews uh, in the Holocaust. And so there were archives who worked with us and, and, uh, and there were private photographs. So all of these are pieces of the puzzle, what we could bring together or photographs of things. Alvaro, if we can stay yes. on the, can you uh, just switch back to the previous yes. image? So di this is from an exhibition that's currently traveling. Uh, yeah. It started in Erlangen at the museum, then went to Wiesbaden, Dortmund, will now move to the Ravensburg Memorial. So here we can see these are all original drawings in watercolor. And and I've, I've had the, the um, the privilege of observing your drawing. And and do you want to talk a little bit about your process? Because you return back to the drawing again and again, and you let the colors flow into each other. And it's through this process that the image emerges. And again, it reminds me of when you say it's an open process, but even your work itself, how, how you bring Emmy stories and Emmy representations of Emmys to life. Uh, you have another clip about that. Do you want to do you want to yes. stand? Yes, I have it already. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yes, we can continue speaking where we watch this. Um, so this was it's just one two minutes, but I I uh, filmed I recorded just uh, the drawing which was the basis of the cover drawing. So this was a drawing which was not so difficult for me because I had a photograph from Emmy and it was only one drawing uh, on the page, not several like uh, with the panels on the other pages. Um, but it shows a little bit what it is important to me, uh, what the drawing, what, yes, about the drawing. So when I start drawing, I never know exactly what will be the drawing in the end. And I like to use this fact that the drawing itself gives me ideas, gives me questions, like I said before, but also um, I discover more. When, when I draw, I think everybody who draws knows that. When I draw, I find out about things. I, I, I look different on things. It's a, con a, a certain concentration. And so the, the, the image is evolving and I tried, I, I, I use these watercolors a lot. They are not controllable. And I like that this is a little bit comparable to the process of memory. Mm -hmm. um, and then on other places, I can go very deep in on detailed spot and look carefully and do, um, a, a, a drawing with many details and the combination of this. I think it's always a balance, um, finding a balance in the image. This goes on a little bit, but we can, we can speak about other things. I want to bring up a question that's related, and that's the issue of subjectivity. You already mentioned that. Um, so I would argue that the work of trust building really brought us closer together as a team. Um, throughout the months and the years, in this case, where we worked together, we really started to care for one another. This meant that we also had to create space for emotions, sometimes tough, difficult emotions. You engaged with Emmy with great sensitivity and respect. You already talked about that, but can you tell us a bit more about your research partnership? With Emmy, how how did you work together with Emmy? So when you, for example, when you showed Emmy the first iteration of, of the cover. What was that process like? Because you always checked with Emmy. When she wanted. Mm -hmm. So when she was, when she, when she said it's okay. So of course there was also a balance where I could, where I wanted to show her again images and where, where it was a good balance again. Um, 
yes, I showed her the cover and we discussed about the cover and there were eight or nine versions of the cover in, in the end. And there was also background color, uh, the background image on the cover, which shows again the, the memory. So it was always a process of um, a dialogue, which was again then depicted into the sketches and the, and the images again. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, what we all of us tried to be was to be very accurate in the, in the historical research-based documentary uh, narration. Um, what we all, what also was the case that we tried, I tried, and Emmy was very, um, yes, that's großzügig, generous with me, that I, how could I do that in the most open artistic style? And I think these are the two poles of the of the narration. A uh, research-based story, which is which is really as accurate as it can be, and then it is as individual as it can be from Amy's narration, from her angle. And then it is so that three sides is uh, told with the most open artistic style. Um, but still, as read, of course, it it, uh, it had to be readable. So we moved around these um, necessities, and and yes, I think that it was the exchange between us and between uh, the, the the biggest circle of of people involved that. Uh, was yes really necessary necessary to form this this book and mm -hmm. then i went back into my studio and i worked on the thing and uh, several weeks and then i came back and we again spoke about it but the memories and the narrations and the, the conversations went on until several weeks before we i finished the book so um it was of course it was never finished it can't be finished like this. Now we have everything. And of course, uh, um, of course, um, we there were parts that were that came in in the very in the very last weeks. So and it is a living process. Like living memory. And I remember even the title, The Color of Memory, came in very, very late. Yes. <laughs> and there were several versions of the title. Yeah. From I'm yeah. a rebel. Um, und deshalb muss ich sprechen, and this is why I need to talk, to just Amy R. Bell, and then The Color of Memory. And I remember you saying, maybe one week before submission day to the publisher, this is the title. And, and so they said yes, and <laughs> and we asked you, and you said yes, and so yes. So it, it was just really flexible right. also. Also, the, the collaboration with the publisher was very, very important. Yeah. It, but it just felt right. And again, it needed that process because we have questions. I don't want to take up too much time, but but one point yeah. I want to bring up because you speak about dialogue and the dialogue is really um, the glue, the, the foundation of this project. Yet, I think it's fair to say that you felt a bit uncomfortable early on bringing yourself into the story <laughs> for reasons that are quite obvious because the focus should be on Emmy. Yet, it's the yeah. two of you, you're creating, creating the story together. So as much as this work is about Emmy, it's also about your relationship with Emmy. Again, we tell the stories, we tell our stories differently to different people. And this is the story that Emmy told you. Um, so this question is really a bit more personal, Barbara. Um, are you... Do you want to talk about this more, bringing yourself into it? And I think all of us learned that memory is relational. Memory doesn't exist. Hank has taught us that. Hank Greenspan, the memory is not in a vacuum. We engage with somebody and actually it's a relationship and it's a telling and it's telling it together. So uh, bringing yourself into it was, was not easy, but necessary. So do you want to just say a little bit more about this process? I think what you said is absolutely right. From From, from my side, it was like, Really, in the beginning, I didn't want to show myself because it's Emmy's book, it's Emmy's room, it's Emmy's life. Um, and then I understood that it's also about transparency. From which angle is this book told? That this is a documentary 
um, necessity, th I think, to, to show how is this told, how I had this process been. And then I found also out now, in addition to, to the things you said, that um, sometimes the, conversa the conversations, how and when Emmy said something and in which situation had been so strong already, but I wanted to show this, the, this very moment. And so I, it was possible sometimes to come very close to the events she told about by showing them directly, or we could go a little bit more in the distance by showing her or sometimes us or her, also sometimes together with her daughter, for example, uh, to speak about these events, to, to speak about. So it's a layer of respect, mm -hmm. a layer of distance, which was uh, a good decision sometimes. So that was also a reason for that. And I have one more question, which I may ask, um, and then and then I'll I'll take the questions from the audience. Please please post your questions in the Q and A. Um, you were tasked to represent scenes and events that occurred both at Ravensbrück and and Bergen Belsen. So images of concentration camps and death camps we know continue to be appropriated and misappropriated in popular culture, but they also become iconic signifiers um how do you how do you represent scenes from places such as Ravensbrück or Bergen Belsen where we where we have already existing images about what these places look like um images of course largely uh, from uh, from liberation Image or images that have been created by perpetrators. We talk about atrocity photography. There is Ravensbrück, of course, does have some self-documentation. So there are drawings from inmate. But yeah. but how do you do that? Um, also as a German artist, Barbara, if I may ask you, how do you how did you tackle this issue of of representing these these sites as as they exist in Emmy's memories? I, th I think what was the most important thing is that now we had, like you said, it was the perspective of Emmy. There haven't been any images from that site. There were her narration and the sources and other sources and, and archives and everything. But how could she produce images? So she told me, and then she, we tried to, to, to make these pictures, to make these drawings that haven't been there before. And um, how to decide what to show and what not to show and where to have an, a more open drawing and where to have a very accurate drawing, where to leave this, that's unsagbare, that not possible to speak, not possible to say it, also reflected on an image which shows maybe an abstract drawing. It was, I tried. I tried and I made several versions of many of these scenes to try which drawing can be done and which is not possible. But where, what can I show also the, the scenes that show violence? Um, what, can, what, what, is, what is important to show and where is a limit where we say, okay, no, this is, um, I can say that in German, um, I don't want to reproduce violence in any way. So uh, to find this balance. It was very intensive, intense. And also, of course, um, uh, it was it was difficult. And, um, I, and it was, yes, it was emotional. And um, for all of us, it was important to also take breaks and again to speak with each other and then to try to go on with the drawing but still the drawing is some is 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 a tool for me to come closer to think it is really something where i discover um stories histories and when i was with emmy uh, last summer in kia tivon i my plan was to support emmy writing an essay, an essay contribution for Color of Memory. 
And Amy, if I remember correctly, we sat down several times and we attempted to write the essay. We never got any further than one or two sentences. And then Amy said, there's nothing I have to say. It's all in Barbara's drawing. And we decided to add the dedication to Amy's mother. That's it. Uh, that was for me so extraordinary. We, 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 could, we couldn't write the essay because it was all in the graphic novel. Everything I want to say was said, but everything was drawn. So thank you very much, Barbara, for that. Now I'm, I am taking a questions from the Q&A and I start right at the top with Ria, who doesn't ask a question, but says extraordinary, exquisite. Thank you so much, Barbara. And thank you so much, Ria. And we go to, over to Hank Greenspan. And some of some of um, the some of the questions might have in part already be answered. Uh, so Barbara, just feel free to to add maybe new insights. So Hank says, wonderful work. This may be a question for Amy. Rel relative to what she says when she speaks at Ravensbrück or elsewhere, what did come to retell that was different in this project? How related to the medium? And how related to your relationship, assuming this really can't be separated. So really the question, how would Emmy remember? I would say, I don't want to speak on behalf of Emmy, but I would say Emmy remembered differently as you showed Emmy drawings. And and but you wanna tell a little bit more about this? So um what did come to retell that was different in this in this project? And again, we're talking from a written testimony of five pages now to 900 drawings. I think there are, of course, the several aspects, but uh, I can say that I think really that the, 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 that the images are, um, they're another language for the drawings. So um, they transport other informations, more information, atmospheres, but maybe to be more precise when precise when I had to do a drawing about the, the let's say the barracks um in the camps and I asked Yami, have you been have you been there? Um was it cold? What was the, the, the floor under your feet? Um have there been other people around you? Um what did you wear? Um did you speak? Was have there been voice? So there are so many questions, and so I could fill this uh, mm. image with more narration, actually, with more information. And so I think this is one part of that. Um, and there were, of course, some more informations personal wise that Emmy shared, special as so especially for the book, um, because she decided on the way that this would be part of her life narration, which we kept in private privacy, in privacy before. And um, and yes, another aspect is, my, the, I think the most important thing is when when time to, so, so like survivors, when they speak about the memories, if, for example, in Ravensburg, in a memorial, they speak about this uh, part of her memory. Their memories. So she speaks about what happened in the camps. But in this book is Emmy's life. So we don't concentrate only on the uh, traumatic memories and but we, we concentrate about her life. What do these kind of memories, what do these consequences do to a life? But how did she react? And and um what is the whole person. And I think that is uh, maybe the biggest difference between these time um, testimonials and the book like this. You showed the panels as well with the multi-layeredness of, of times and voices. So it's Emmy as she speaks about the past, then we go back straight into the past. Then we have the visual representation of the past. Then we have the conversation of the past. While we still have Emmy's perspective here and now, that scene where you showed, but I, where she was next to her mother, and and Emmy has no voice, has no mouth, she can't well, speak, yeah. and then she says, "But I was standing." 
But at that scene, Emmy was sitting in the here and now playing solitaire. So this overlap of past and present, but also the voices, the, the richness of, of showing a life that is still fully present yet has moved on. And the shift in perspective, like sometimes it's Emmy's recollections as a small child, then it's the Emmy here and now, then it's a story as has been told to Emmy. And to bring all of that into one work, that is extraordinary. And I cannot think of other any other art form that is able to, to bring a dialogue of language, temporal perspective in, into, into, onto one page. And by the way, the exhibition, you see the page and the page creates waves. The page is not, is not, <laughs> it's, flat. Not flat. And, <laughs> it's not flat. And, and I was just stunned to see yet another layer. It's the ripple effects are in the page itself. Another thing I noticed, and I think is the face of Emmy. The face of Emmy changes throughout the book. And I remember early on saying, Barbara, that face of Emmy on page 102 does, looks nothing like Emmy's face on page three. And yes, you said, right. that's, that's for a reason. Yes. Emmy's face it's, changes. It's it's changing. The, the, the kind of drawing is changing while, while we are, I am working on a book. Uh, over during some years yeah now that but i just want to also say that, that your dedication your enormous care and 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 it went above and beyond what we could have expected in the project and the same for miriam libiki and gilad selektar it was it is also very different than maybe a more traditional eyewitness testimony where where you i either have a listener that's a witness that receives the testimony. In your case, you really work together on the testimony. And it was only possible because of the trust that you had. And 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 you didn't want to dehumanize Emmy again. So it's really showing what Emmy allowed you to, sh to show. And you always clearly indicated as well. When Emmy said, that's enough then we're not going any further. I'm ready to say that. And all of these processes um, are, are very unique to this form of sharing and storytelling and, and being together in that space of storytelling. So it's, it's really very, very unique. And I just wanted to add to that because I was able to witness this process and it convinced me that that this form of of storytelling is so incredibly powerful for telling the the story of stories of ge genocide survivors. Uh, hopefully, Hank, we answer this properly uh, to your satisfaction. And now we're going on to oh, I I lost it to Dragana Radanovic who asked. Um, thank you for this wonderful presentation. I'm curious to hear more about Barbara's process of puzzling the story together into the narrative. You're only already explained a bit, but how did that process happen? I'm curious to understand more about how did you get to know what will end up in the book? We, you spoke about that already. Is there any other part that, that you still like to share with us today? Maybe I can add just to, to, yes. to, to understand a bit that there were several um, stapel um, of papers. So the storyboard from the whole book, I, I did it several times. So, and I used several techniques. So it was also, I, I also use um, digital uh, tools and I combine it with the analog work and, and scribbling and so. And this, I think until I decided now I, I, I paint the pages before that was most of the work. So it was two or three years, of course, with not, not continue, not not all the time we had breaks and and there were other things to do but but the wild time of two to two three years i collect the the sketches and the scenes and then it's again like this huge puzzle i put together the scenes and then this scene goes out and then this scene goes and a new scene goes in and charlotte you know um um how long uh 
we worked on on this these decisions which uh, themes go in which words go in which sentence go in which drawing go in and then goes out again and so there were several of the stages of these storyboards and then i would start to paint mm -hmm. and the paint so the, the the colored pages have been taken the, the, the not a year in the end i did it very very fast for my uh, for my normal um, workflow because then i knew okay now we go quick really fulfill this because the process also and emmy told it to me also we spoke about that it's really intense um and for her of course it was most intense and most uh, also a, a process which was very important to her but also she said it uh, very very exhausting Now I'm jumping um, to Valeska, who you know. Um, Blau is this, oops, Blau's house, and then it says Bre. Das ist a Bremen. Valeska Wilczek. So Valeska says, students of my colleague Sandra in Freiburg had the privilege to have a workshop with you, Barbara. Yes. A couple of weeks ago, when you spoke about the empty spaces, memories, the things that happened, but Amy didn't have birds for. Is that the process with young people that works so well? Because drawing helps the students as well to transform their experiences yeah, yeah. and unknown thoughts. Here is a trauma-informed approach that that my my colleague Andy is of course working with, working in the classroom, creating this empty space. So is that the process with young people that work so well, using that empty space to draw the students into the storytelling as well? Because they have to start using the imagination because you never tell the whole story, yes. graphic novel. Besides besides the decision, what, what's in it and what's not there and what's not there is actually there as well. But it needs the added imagination of the viewer that completes the story. And so that connects. That connects, that the yeah. And that connects the words, the image, and the empty spaces. So the reader is in the story very quickly. And I I I did several uh, school readings and I was amazed how um intensively the most of the students really listened and asked questions. And this is because Emmy's voice, Emmy's words are so clear, present, important. And then there is the story and, and with the drawings that is not, I think, expectable for them. Um, mm. it, is com it's, it is mostly a new, I don't know, images that they don't know yet. And these openness of the images seems to be able to draw, to pull them into the story. Um, also, of course, when we see footage, like documented pictures from the past, they are in black and white, so it makes a distance. We know it's, 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 it's the past, but when we see colored images, um, this can be present, this can be past, so it's not clear, so we don't have this distance. I think there are many reasons, um, but I also, I think the reason what I found out, it's about the young adults themselves. They have, mm -hmm. they, 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 who, whom I met, they have been very open to, to look and to listen and to, um, to be capable to, 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 to understand these ma many layers of her life and also of the art. Mm. Now I uh, would like to go over the next question by Mina and this ties into that. How did you come up with the interpretation of time in the graphic novel? Intersex intersection of the present time with the past. Now that's a mm. big light motif in Emmy's stories going back and forth. So, and while you answer, I put, uh, I stopped my video because I have two colleagues outside my door. They're very but, loud. So I have to tell them. Sorry, sorry. sorry can, can you repeat the question again? Yes. How did you come up with the interpretation of time in the graphic novel intersection? So it, weaving together the present and the past. So you already spoke yeah. about that, but yeah. this has been a very conscious de decision. If you'd like to just say a little bit more about yes, that. Yes, of course. Of course. Thank you. 
I think uh, it is clear that memory, and especially the memory of a young child like Amy, is never chronological. There are spots that are that are memorized. There are other spots they are not there, and they sometimes they mix. Sometimes it's not clear what was before, what was after. And there are connections, of course, and we can document that and research that. But still, I wanted to show the non-chronologically of memory. And then I wanted to mix times because that is, uh, that is uh, mix times uh, not to tell the whole story in chronological way because uh, this is, again, the her angle, um, her perspective, that the memories, I think I talked about this uh, earlier, um, that that her memories come into the present. And the separation between this, uh, there is no, this, I don't describe it with words. So there are color rooms and we understand it, but we understand it when we read it more intuitively um, than than that, 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 than that it was would be described to us. And I think you beautifully show it with the color that flows a, across these temporal layers. Um, yeah, there really are, of course, weaving yeah. into each yeah. other. Sorry for yeah. interrupting you. That there yeah. are words from the present that they are then connected with, with um, images from the past and other way around. So, of course, this also... Uh, irritation sometimes yeah. is an important part of the story. Well, but how is irritation? You want to say a little bit, how is irritation an important part of the story? Irritation, tension. Because it's part of the story. Mm -hmm. Being not oriented, being, being, being not safe, mm -hmm. being... Um, and I think to to understand that I can use the narration and mm -hmm. to to mm -hmm. to narrate it and and then also in an can you say unsecure way so that's surprising sometimes or, or shocking of course it's also mm -hmm. part of it. yeah but of course for this process to to happen and to flow it needs enormous trust the trust to be able to share to share these stories and and allow them to to move and into the directions that are not predictable. And again, this is only possible yes. just yes. because of the great care and respect you took in, tell, in telling Emmy's story. Now I'm looking at the time. We have a little bit of time and my enthusiastic colleagues come down. So this is a question from um, Harini. Um, thank you, Barbara, for this powerful sharing and inspiring visual storytelling, methodologically and creatively. Thanks, Emmy for sharing your important story. You are indeed strong. And Barbara, Charlotte, and team for drawing the story. So Barbara, how do you find that visual art as, as a tool of inquiry um, to surface stories and experience in ways that are different from other modalities like music, words, dance? Mm. It's a good question too. So what's special about graphic art that is not just working but it's working particularly well and i i tell oftentimes that reviews in german newspapers oftentimes says it, it's a graphic novel but it works and i always <laughs> say no 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 it's working because it's a graphic novel so how is that approach in your views different from other modalities theater dance music what's so unique about graphic novels and how it combines text, rhythm, visual language. Rhythm is a good is mm. a good word. Mm. Uh, I will come back to that. So first of all, of course, I I I am only able to to do graphic novels. So I I would not say that the graphic novel is better than other mediums. I think music and other forms of art uh, and art of documentation and of scientific work, of course, um, are important ways to tell story, to tell history. But I can I can speak about the graphic novel, the form, and I think it there are there are certain things um, that can really 
show something and I say show because also in written words we have empty spaces of course also in written words we have rhythm we have different time layers and so but in the graphic novel you can see them and I think this is so interesting that we make them visible and an empty space of memory is really a visible thing in a film you could also have empty spaces but then you move on with the images in a book you can really hold it so it's there it's there you can pause um you can go back to them and i think also um oh yeah i come back to the rhythm so rhythm in the case of this book i really found out how how good uh, how well the, the the panels and the form of the graphic novel is usable to show the rhythm of a word of words and not only a rhythm when i read it loud so i can also read this rhythm but I, also when i would read it um, in silence i read the rhythm of a sentence and i read the breaks i read the pause can you say pause so i read the silence in between I read the sigh and I think also combined then again with the images, visible images, images that they show only these uh, um, gaps. Yeah, that is special, I think, in this medium. And, what and is I was glad to find out, to find a, a, a way to show Emmy's voice, Emmy's way of speaking um, in a visual medium. We can't hear her, but we can follow this and we can feel it. And of course, then again, sorry, drawing, of course, is able to 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 uh, show uh, pictures that we can that are not there anymore or that are only in Im imagination or so. So this is an, a very easy, well, not maybe easy, but very visible way to create these pictures. Um, without a bigger effort for like a film would do, for example. And the stillness of the experience you described so well. So when I started familiarizing myself with the language of graphic novels, I was not as a Germanist. I, I really thought it would be stills, capturing stills like in a film, but but you be you rest with the image and you actually look at it. And 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 you determine your own pace. The students yes. determine the reader determines their own yes. rhythm and pace, uh, how they engage with the with the visual work. You mentioned empty space again and again, and and I think it's it's empty, but it's not empty. It's it's there. Yes. It, it has a presence in written words alone. It's it doesn't exist, but here it exists in a panel, and and it holds a strong presence. Um, that is ex that is embodied in a memory, in in a in a body itself, but cannot exist in 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 any in any other form. And again, the multiplicity of the voices, the tension, the contradictions, it's all very very beautifully captured. So I I I also think I it's ideally suited, and again also as a medium of of long term engagement um for the survivors because and, and, and now emmy i'm i'm very sorry to call emmy a survivor because it was very clear emmy doesn't want to be called a survivor and rightly so because this emmy is so much more but but the way that through the engagement that you brought memories back to emmy you drew images that emmy only had in herself she's never seen those there came maybe in her dreams but but now they're on paper and that's an incredibly powerful act of storytelling as well. Now it's 2.26 here, Pacific Center time. And I think the organizers want me soon to wrap up, which I have and my forgiveness. I'm very sorry for the questions that we cannot answer. I hope in part they're answered 
already one question from Francesca regarding how to deal with lack of information. Francesca, probably the suggestion was to bring yourself into your own graphic novel, how you search, how you trace the story. And Olga asked uh, ask a very important question about um, contemporary contextualizing it. Um, for example, Ukrainian memories of violence and pain. Uh, are we still talking about long memory when past and present intersect? Absolutely. And Olga, this would really uh, need a whole panel presentation on its own. And of course, Nora Krug's most recent graphic novel deals specifically also yeah. Uh, with the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine. Again, how powerful. And early on, we had illustrators, Ukrainian illustrators, creating a visual archive of resistance. And it became very clear why visual storytelling was so important. But I'd like to wrap up with one comment by my dear friend Jane Hawks, who writes, honored to hear such a rich discussion between two remarkable women. Oh, my God, this is not appraising myself. So uh, but uh, very informative and very moving. Thank you, Jane. Also sending much gratitude and respect to Emmy. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. We also would like to thank Emmy from the bottom of our hearts. It's hard not to start crying when we think of Emmy, how an incredible, extraordinary woman Emmy is. And, and we have been honored that she's participating in this project. And Barbara, the same with you. It was a dream come true when you said, yes, I'm going to work with you because I contacted you on Facebook Messenger and you actually were interested in speaking with me. That was uh, one of my happiest days and I'm eternally grateful that, that you responded to this obscure Germanist in Canada and that, that reached out to you. So thank you so thank much you, for that. Thank you. Thank you for everything, uh, Barbara. And I have now need to wrap up. So I would like to uh, thank Barbara, Emmy, everybody again for joining us for a webinar session uh, today. And uh, I would like to ask, tell you a little bit about the next webinar. It's on Thursday, April 4th at 11 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. It's titled Empowering Narratives, Videotaped Interviews versus Graphic Novels. And this upcome, in this upcoming session, Ur Ungur from the New York Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies in Amsterdam will be in conversation uh, with Peter Klein, who is the founder of the Global Reporting Center, a UBC based nonprofit focused on producing and innovating journalism on underreported issues around the world. So this will be a very interesting conversation about um, think, thinking about journalistic practices vis-a-vis -vis the art and practice of, of graphic art storytelling. And our two esteemed colleagues who are also very much involved in the project will discuss how the act of coercive televised confessions by intelligence agencies has cast a long shadow, making traditional video interviews a source of anxiety and distrust. Ur and Peter will delve into the ethical dimensions of interview methodologies, particularly examining the discomfort and potential trauma associated with videotaped interviews in authoritarian countries such as Syria, Iran, or China. So we look forward to seeing all of you again at our next upcoming webinar session. And again, Barbara, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much, Amy as well, and to everybody being with us to today. Take good care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Charlotte.